is a lot of the world, well, a lot of the church, American church in particular, is operating on the basic levels of knowledge of Jesus Christ. They haven't really gone deeper and tapped into certain things and certain knowledge of Christ. So we don't really see the healings. We don't really see the, the, the anointing and the authority that we should when we preach Jesus Christ. God bless you. So the Lord has been having me to study upon Jesus, study some more things, study his miracles, study who he is and what he has done. And so I believed this week that he wants me to continually to preach on Jesus so that we can open our eyes to the power that we have through Jesus Christ, through his name, through his Holy Ghost, and the fact that he's died on the cross. Can we turn to Genesis chapter 28? We're going to start at verse 10. And then we're going to go down to verse 13, then go to 15 to 19. And then keep your hand on John, St. John, chapter 1, verse 45. And when you have it, say amen. Can we stand and read the word of the Lord? Those who can stand. Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. Can we all, well, I will read it to you. Just follow along with me. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and laid down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father and the God of Isaac the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Verse 15. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places, whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee, until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and said, and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. I will repeat that again. And, he's, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose early in the morning rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at first. St. John chapter 1. Verse 45 through 51. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, right. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. It means dishonesty. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Saying, Where do you know me from? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. 
Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I'll read it again. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, O God, that you deliver your word to the people. Decrease me as you increase, O God. Take over my spirit, O God, and let your uncorrupted word, O God, come through and speak to the hearts of the people. In the name of Jesus, let everything come together, O God, and bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. In Genesis 28, particularly at this moment, Jacob is on the run because of his treachery and significant events involving his brother and his mother. You know, he stole Esau's birthright, and then he ended up taking Esau's blessing by tricking his father, whose eyes are dull of seeing, tricking his father, thinking that he was uh, Esau, and then his father blessed him. Uh, he, he took his blessing, which made Jacob uh, ahead of Esau, which gave Jacob the inheritance that I Abraham and Isaac had, which will he would inherit uh, the land of Canaan. So after he did this, after he tricked his brother Esau and got his blessing, now his brother Esau wants to kill him. So his mother finds a way to and finds an excuse to find to try to get Jacob out of the land he was in. So his mother finds the fact that she wants her son to get married. That wasn't the reason she wanted to send Jacob out of the land that he was in, which was the land of Canaan. She wanted to send Jacob out of the land so that he can be safe from his furious brother. So she said, OK, how can I get him out of here? OK, let's find an excuse to have him get married. Abraham, Isaac, I don't want my son to get married to a Canaanite woman. Can he get can he go find a wife another place? And Isaac says, OK, let's send our son to a place where he can find a wife uh, down in a good place. And that was Re Re Rebecca, uh, Jacob's mother, Rebecca's brother. He would find a wife there. So sometimes your mother trying to send you to find a wife, you, you might want to question <laughs> question what she's trying to do. She's trying to get you out of the house for <laughs> a certain reason or not. But he's on the run. He's going down to this place because he's on the run from his brother. And he is sent out of this, his own land. So he's on the run and God comes into his dream when he's journeying onto this place, which is called Pan Padan Aram, where his uncle Laban lives. He's journeying onto this place, and he gets tired, a little sleepy, because the sun is going down, and sometimes in desert places and uh, dark places, you really don't want to travel uh, that long in dark places. So he finds a place to sleep, get grabs a rock, lay his head on that rock, and he goes to sleep. God visits him in his dream. While he's sleeping on the edge of the land, he's almost out of Canaan, but he's still inside of Canaan. He's almost out. God comes to him, informing him that he will bring him back to this land, which he has inherited. Jacob is leaving out of the land, which he has inherited, and God is saying, I'm going to bring you back to this land. This means that due to God's will and informing Rebekah that Jacob would be the greatest of the two sons and due to God's impeccable ability to execute his own plans, it's in fact that it's God who set up this plan for Jacob to be moved out 
of his own land at this time. So God has let him know that I am the one who moved you out, but it's also me who will bring you back in. Sometimes God moves you out of a certain place so you can get something in the next stage. You can get something in a different place just so he can bring you back when you're ready. So God was moving Jacob out of Canaan to go to Padan Aram so that he can bring him back with something. He would bring him back, and we know the story, he would bring him back uh, with, with 11 of the children of Israel and all the wives. And so Jacob would indeed come back ready to start the family. Jacob would indeed come back with, with a new name. So God sent him out to get him ready to come back in. So God assured Jacob, Jacob, I am promising you, I'm putting you out for right now, but I am bringing you back to the land where you came from. To me, that sounds like Jesus Christ. He left heaven to come on earth, do his business, but he has to go back to heaven to, 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 to send the Holy Ghost. So he's gone out, take care of his earthly business, come back so that he can finish the job in heaven. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen again. But what is interesting to me at this time in this dream is the, f is, is the content of the dream. What was in the dream. Yes, he had a dream that God was going to bring him back. But what was most interesting is the content of the dream. The Bible states that a ladder was set up on the earth. Some scholars say staircase. So if you are visual, you can visual a very tall ladder or you can visualize a very tall staircase. But wherever it is, it was set up from earth to heaven. Set up from this realm to the heavenly realm. And angels of God was ascending, going up, and descending on this ladder. So this ladder was a form of transportation for, um, for heavenly beings from earth to heaven and heaven to earth. Somebody say, God is working in between realms. God is working in between realms. He's working in heaven and he's working on earth. So this ladder was a transportation device for these angels from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. The Bible soon tells us by what Jesus said in John chapter uh, 1 and 51 that we will soon see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Bible soon tells, lets us know by what Jesus said that this ladder is actually a representation of him. This ladder is actually him being the pathway between earth and heaven. He will soon reconnect what was lost. So he is being that pathway. So it's foreshadowing to Jacob, even though he may not understand yet, is foreshadowing the future Christ. He's thinking, okay, God is showing me that I'm just going to go to one place and come back to my own country. But what God is really showing him is the future work of Christ. I, I am very glad, I am very excited that God shows plans to his people. Some of us may have had visions, some of us may have had dreams. Uh, we may not have known every detail inside that dream, but was, it's good to know that God is always giving and divulging information to his people. He's always giving out things, whether you understand it or not. He will remind you. Remember when I showed you this? That's why I showed you that. Remember when I told you this? That was for that. Sooner or later, I'm going to let you realize and, and have a revelation of the information that I have given you. Somebody said, Lord, thank you for the information. But we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus was this ladder a little late later. Jacob awakening out of his sleep, he realized the significance and the heaviness of this dream. The fact that God met him on earth. The heavenly God met him on earth. He realized this dream and he is afraid. 
he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. So he's waking up and realizing that the presence of God is in this place. I am realizing that I am not alone, but there's the presence of the almighty God where I am. You must be excited when you realize that God is with you. It's something to realize that God is where you are because even though God is omnipresent, God doesn't show up everywhere. Even though God can see everything, he doesn't manifest his presence everywhere. So what Jacob realizes is the fact that God is in this place. But there's a temple of altar and God is in your midst. And every service that you have, you should come in here with the fear that God is in this sanctuary. Whatever room you are in, God can transport to that room and make that room a heavenly place. And when you are in heavenly places, when God connects heaven and earth where you are, crazy, all all kinds of things can happen in your vicinity. People can be healed. People can be delivered because the power of God in heaven is strong. And when he connects to where you are, he brings the power from where he is to where you are. So Jacob realized surely God is in this place and I knew it not. It escaped me that God was here. I'm afraid, but now I'm going to reverence the Lord. He goes on to say this is none other than than the house of God where I am where I just woke up where I went to sleep is a house of God it's a dimension it's a place where God sets himself in because Jacob realized he doesn't go everywhere so this is a special place where I shall meet God this is a special place where God comes and he says this is a house of God the place where God lives and it is the gate of heaven The word gate is is mean opening. It's opening and closing something within a space. So this is the place where heaven opens. This is the place where earth enters heaven. Not exactly in the same realm, but spiritually transporting me from earth into a heavenly place. This is the gate of heaven where I go to meet God. Somebody said, come on, Jesus, just allow me to walk through the gate of heaven. Hallelujah. He realized this is the place where heaven and earth meet, heaven and earth kiss. I can come into this place. I am where God is right there. And I am where it's supernatural and is natural at the same time. And I am in the physical presence of God. I am where supernatural things can happen. I am where heavenly things can happen, where God can get power from earth to me. I am in this place and I shall reverence it. He then rises up, set up a stone, which he slept on as a pillar, pours oil on it, anoints it, and calls the name of that place Bethel, meaning the house of God. He's commemorating this place, saying it is God's house. So he renames an entire city. It was previously called Luz. Now he's commemorating this place and naming it Bethel. This is the house of God. And sooner or later, Bethel becomes really sincere, really uh, um, dedicated, really prominent to Joseph, I mean Jacob, because this is not the only time God meets Jacob in Bethel. God also meets Jacob later in chapter 36, 35 in Bethel, and he renames that place the same place, Bethel, because this has become a place where Jacob realized, okay, I now can meet God here. So wherever you are in your life, you must get a place. Uh, Jesus is everywhere, but you must get a place in your mind where, God, I have to meet you and I have to go to a certain place to meet you. I can meet you in my prayer closet. I can meet you in my car. I need a place where I can meet you, Jesus Christ. And he is inside of you. So wherever you decide to commemorate a place to meet you, he will show up. If you're ready to be there, if you come with your mind, God will show up. 
But if you show up in your service and you're sitting and you're expecting just to give your offering and leave, God will not show up for you. He will show up to the person next to you. That's how bad he is, but he will not show up to you in your seat. That's how God can work. That's how this gate thing works. God can show up anywhere, any small place, and any big place at the same time. The person next to you is getting a breakthrough, but because you didn't bring your mind to the situation, you're still locked into what you were in. So you have to bring your mind and your spirit to this place where God can meet you. Through this encounter, we see God comes from heaven to meet Jacob where he was. God comes from heaven to meet his people. God leaves his heavenly realm to come and meet us where we are. Low humans, low servants. God says, I like the humans, even though they are disgusting and they're, they're crazy and they're, they're mad and they're jealous, I like to interact with them. So I have to set up regular times and regular periods where I interact and I visit my people. So I, me, because I am supernatural and I'm great, I have to come to meet my people somewhere. Yes, when Adam fell, that relationship was broken. So I didn't have that same relationship with the people, but I still had a desire to meet them somewhere. So God devised a plan. How can I meet them and reconnect this gate? How can I reconnect this place where I love to meet them? Because right now we're disconnected. So I have to get to a place where we can be reconnected and that we can experience that love once again. Come on, somebody say, I think I know where he's going. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Matthew uh, 25 and 14 that, that the kingdom of heaven is like a, a, a master who who's leaves his country and he goes to another country and he distributes his good. So this is a master leaving where he is originally from and going to a different place, calling his servants and giving them good so they can work. So it's obviously that his servants are in one place and he is another in another place. So he leaves where he's from, goes to them and interacts with them. Hallelujah. This is where Jesus comes in. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is God's plan to, to meet his people where they are. Jesus is God's plan because he said we are disconnected right now. So Jesus, the son of God, will be my plan to get close to them so that I can be with them like I did with Adam and like I visited Jacob. I'm coming as Jesus so that I can physically be around my people so that we can feel that new connection. But that new connection, it was not fully connected yet. But Jesus was starting the work. He was starting that reconnection. It is extremely interesting to me that Jesus' validity of the, as the Messiah was always questioned. It was frequently questioned because of where he was from. It was frequently questioned by the people because they thought uh, and they knew his parents. So they they thought we know where you from, Jesus. You from an earthly town. You're from an earthly place. They questioned him because he was raised and thought to be born in Nazareth. Since he was uh, lived in Nazareth most of, his, most of his life, people just automatically assume he was born in Nazareth. So, so, so it's just like you. You might be born in Alaska, but you live most of your life in Missouri, so we ain't never gonna think you was born from Alaska because we always seen you in Missouri. So we're just gonna automatically think Packy, Lawrence Brown the third was born born in Missouri and ain't nobody gonna tell me the difference. I'm gonna believe that he was born there. And because he was raised in Nazareth, it escapes people understanding that he was actually born in Bethlehem as the scriptures tells us that Jesus will be born. 
So because they thought one way, they actually missed the fact that he was right in the scriptures. He was born in Bethlehem. Some people even stated in John 7 and 27 that because they knew where he was from, that he could not be the Messiah. Because they thought that the Messiah would just appear out of nowhere. So the fact that we can pinpoint where you're from, you're not from heaven. You're just from an earth. You're just from a place called Nazareth. You're just from a place that we have seen before. Nobody would think that anybody from Missouri is from heaven because they ex they can pinpoint where you are from. Some people uh, simply thought that because we, be we know where your parents are from that we can say that you're not the Messiah. We know your dad. You're, 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 you're not the son of God. Your father is Joseph and your mother is Mary. So we have a human track record of the fact that you are from earth and you're not going to trick us into telling us otherwise. Hallelujah. Somebody say, uh, somebody say, you're missing the picture. You're mixing the picture. Jesus is from somewhere that you do not, do, do not know of. Specifically, this is why Nathaniel is questioning the messiahship of Jesus when Philip tells him, we have found him. We have found Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel begins to say, wait a sec. I, I, I'm beginning to go back in my mind just like some of the other people. Can anything good come out of Nazareth. What was so bad or what was so wrong about Nazareth that the Messiah couldn't come from it? Uh, Nazareth was an obscure city. It was of no reputation, of no importance. So Nazareth was hardly considered. It's just like saying Jesus came from some hick town in the country. We don't know where it's from, so we don't really care about it. So the great Messiah cannot come from such a place that is unimportant to us. It was it was most likely sent in the Old Testament. Uh, King Solomon gave King Har Haram uh, some Galilee cities, and King Haram looked at the Galilee cities and said, these are good for nothing. So it looks like the cities were probably poor. Cities of Galilee had nothing to offer it. So somebody would say Jesus is not coming from some poor city. It's just like Jesus coming from the projects. That's The Messiah is not coming from there. He, we think he's going to come from a rich house. And then and other people, so because the Galilee was sometimes and mostly populated uh, with people who weren't Jews. And down in time, other uh, uh, nations and other people came in and moved in Gal Galilee and moved some of the Jews out. So Galilee was operated and, and it was inhabited by people who were not Jews. So the Pharisees definitely said, uh -uh, the Messiah is not coming from a place that's, that's you're living with Jews because the Jews hardly like some Samaritan people. So they're definitely not going to think the Messiah is coming from a place where you're harboring and you're living with people who aren't God's people. The Messiah has to come from a clean and clear place. The Messiah has to come from a place of the people of God. That's why when Nicodemus came to the Pharisees and Nicodemus tried to be on Jesus' side, they, they turned to him and said, search and look. No prophet has ever come come from Galilee. No prophet has ever come from this place, this unimportant place. So Jesus is not from there. So they kept on misunderstanding Jesus. They kept on looking down upon Jesus. They kept on disliking Jesus because of where they thought he was from. And they kept on misseeing the fact that he is the ultimate and the supernatural Messiah, but because they couldn't get past the fact where he was from. Somebody say, don't judge me because of where you think I'm from. If I come out the project, I can still be a king. If I come out a dirty place, if I come out a home where it's only one parent, I can still be a king. I can still be a queen. I may have come from a place so place where we don't have a lot of food but when I get to the place where God wants me to be I can rise up farther than you ever thought I can rise up I may not have as much money as you have but when I get to the place I'm gonna have past what you have because I am walking in what God has for me so don't judge me because of where you think I am from the fact is they were really wrong
Even though all these people had these different thoughts, they failed to realize where Jesus was really from. When Nicodemus comes to Jesus Christ, when Nicodemus comes in John chapter 3, Nicodemus asks him, he, he starts asking him questions about you must be from God because you have done things that we have that no other man can do. There's something about you, uh, Nicodemus. There's something about you, Jesus, that I just need to know about. And in John chapter 3, uh, verse 13, Jesus reveals to Nicodemus something that everybody has been missing. Jesus says, no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that has come down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So he just revealed to Nicodemus a Pharisee who just wanted to come see what Jesus is really about. He reveals to him where he really is from. He reveals him, yes, I was born in Bethlehem. Yes, I lived in Nazareth. Yes, I have two human parents, and, and one of my parents, is he, he didn't even create me. I, yes, I have a human mother, but let me tell you a secret, Nicodemus. I am really from heaven. <laughs> Nicodemus, I am giving you a secret. Everybody else doesn't get it, but I'm really actually from heaven, Nicodemus. In other words, Jesus saying, I originated from heaven and I am still in heaven. He said that he had not ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. So he was telling him, I am from heaven, but I am still in heaven at the same time. So what I'm really telling you, Nicodemus, I am God. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, gets this. He, 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 he's revealing this information to somebody like a Pharisee. This is what Jesus was trying to get the people to understand in John 6 and 33. This was after the, the miracle of the two fish and the five loaves. They didn't get the miracle. They didn't understand that Jesus was the almighty God. So they came back trying to find Jesus when he left. Jesus looked at him and said, you're not trying to come to me because you know who I am. You're just trying to come to me because you ate some food. You got full and you probably want some more. Well, I'm not about to give you a fish fry dinner because I just gave you one. I really wanted you to get the point of what I was doing. I am God. I am trying to get you to understand who I am and where I was from. And Jesus said, labor not for the meat which perish, but labor to everlasting life. They still didn't get it. After they questioned him, well, mister, what shall we do to do the works of God? He said, believe on me. And they said, well, uh, that sounds pretty good. I don't know what that means. I don't know what believe on you means. So what, shall, what, what kind of sign shall you give us? Because Moses gave us a sign. He fed us manna from heaven. He gave us manna to eat our ancestors. Moses and Joshua, they gave us manna in the desert. So we were getting things from heaven. And since you want to tell us, since you want to show us how big and bad you are, do something that will let us know who you really are. So Jesus said, okay, since you want to go that way, Moses did not feed you the bread from heaven. I am the bread from heaven. Since I, I'm trying to get you to understand something, and every turn you give me, every excuse you give me, I got an answer from that. Since you want to talk about bread, I am the bread from heaven, and I am the life. And if you eat me, if you feed on me, you shall receive life. He, I give life to the world. He who is the bread of life. He that he is the bread of life. He that hungers shall never hunger again. If you want to realize who I am and if you want to see who the Messiah really is, look at me. I am from heaven. He said, for he came down from heaven, not to do his will, but the will of him that sent me. 
I came down from heaven with an assignment. I didn't come down to heaven just to look at you guys. I came from heaven to reconnect something that was lost. I came from heaven to reconnect the relationship on earth that was lost. You people lost your keys. You people lost everything through Adam and through the generations you kept on messing up. So I am here from heaven because the only one who can give life is from heaven because heaven came from God who is heaven came from, life came from heaven who is in God God gives life because he is from heaven so Jesus said I am the only one qualified to give life because I am from heaven and anybody on this earth does not have the power to give life because you are all messed up but I am the perfect one who was born without sin and I am from heaven the life giving place so now you can have life because you believe on me you believe on on me. He said, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus said, I am getting ready to connect heaven and earth, and I'm getting ready to do something supernatural. You're not going to live these earthly lives, but you're going to live powerful lives that you are you are in, empowered by God who is from heaven. You will be empowered by a supernatural God that is what I am trying to do in your life and you must understand this stop looking at where you think I am from and realize where I am really from I am supernatural and what I'm about to do you cannot fathom please get the point please get the point so we have to look at Jesus and get the point of what he is trying to do. So Jesus was demonstrating that he is the pathway which allows heaven to kiss the earth. He was God visiting the earth from one dimension to the other. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And guess what? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You Pharisees think you got it. You people of earth, you think you got it. Where nobody's going to get to that place with God, nobody's going to get to their relationship, that reconnection with God, unless you come through me, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Unless you come through me, you will not get what you really have been waiting for all these years. The only way to come is through Jesus Christ. The reason that Jesus Christ can get to you, because he came from God. The reason why Jesus Christ can get salvation to you, because salvation comes from God and he is from God. So if you want salvation and you want God, you have to look to the one who is from God. You want power, you want anointing, and you want to get closer to God, you have to look to the one who is from God. You want peace, you want prosperity, you want blessing, all of that comes from God, but it comes through the one who is from God. You want health in your body you and that health comes from God but you have to look to the one who is from God you want everything in your life to work right but how the peace and prosperity and blessings come from God but it comes through the one who is from God so if you want anything in this life look to God but look to the one who is from God and his name is Jesus you want peace get it from Jesus you want money get it from Jesus you want prosperity get it from Jesus you want help get it from Jesus you want salvation get it from Jesus because he is the only one qualified to give it he's the only one qualified to give it to you so we get back to Nathaniel. He asks, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? But he's about to find out that he's about to find out where Jesus really is from. He shouldn't have asked that question. He shouldn't have gone off at his mouth to say, can anything good come from Nazareth? Because he is about to find out who Jesus really is. Jesus says to him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. There is no deceit. Nathaniel thinking that this man from Nazareth cannot do anything. This man from Nazareth, he's probably 
following Philip and thinking this is a joke, but because I know Philip, I'm going to go and see what this is. This is a joke to me, but uh, he's my friend. So, And you, you know how you do some things your friends say. You know it's a stupid idea, but you're just going to do it anyway. That's probably what he was thinking. I'm going to go see, but who knows? This may be a joke. He gets there, and Jesus says to him this thing that I just told you. Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel asks Whence knowest thou me? Nathaniel looks at him and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do you know me? Where do you know me from? I have never seen you. Jesus is about to reveal himself to Nathaniel. Jesus says, before Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathaniel says, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, wait a second. This must be the son of God, the king of Israel. Sometimes you are in your place where you're questioning God and you're thinking God can't do a thing and you're thinking God is not in a place. Sometimes he has to show you that I know everything about you. He has to show you, yes, you don't think I can do it, but I'm about to say something to you that is about to blow your mind and reveal to you who I am. I'm about to come into your situation and I'm going to reveal to you when you think I couldn't work, when you think I couldn't speak to you, when you think I couldn't bring it to pass, I am about to blow it up in your face and show you how I can work. Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. What did this mean? He said, Nathaniel, I wasn't there, but I was looking at you from heaven. Nathaniel, I wasn't sitting with you under the fig tree, but I'm about to show you my omnipresence. I'm about to show you my omniscience, and I'm about to show you that I am looking at you from heaven. Nathaniel, I see everything you're going through. Nathaniel, I know you. Nathaniel, I looked inside of you, and God may be saying to some of you, I see everything you're going through. I know know the heartaches that you're going through I know the pain that's in your heart but I see everything from heaven the problem with us that we don't think that Jesus is still working the problem with us is we think that Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. He did his last final work, and we don't think that he's still doing anything. We think that he's in heaven sitting up with his feet plopped out, and he's laying on the couch saying, Angel, go give me a drink of water. Angel, do this, do that. But we don't, we don't realize that Jesus is constantly working in the earth. Jesus is constantly watching us. Jesus is constantly seeing us. Jesus is constantly testing us. The Bible says he is interceding for us. So he's constantly 24-7 working for us, working for you, talking to you in the midnight hour when you think you're alone. He's talking to you in the morning when you just lost everything. He's speaking to you from where you are when you don't think he's around. All of a sudden, he's a pop of thought in your mind, and you start speaking in tongues because you realize that God is with me every moment of your day he's watching you and he's caring for you when you didn't think he was there he is there Jesus Christ is there so Jesus looks at him and why Nathaniel is thinking about this Jesus and Nathaniel then says that you are the king of Israel and you uh, you are the son of God Jesus questioned him and said because I said I saw thee under the fig tree believest thou you shall see greater works than these he said it took that little thing for me to to say to you to get you to believe and that that's how God wants some of you. Some of you, it takes hard things. Some of you, he has to smash things. He has to knock people out your life. Some of you, he has to make drastic things happen before you realize that he is who he is. So God has said to Nathaniel, you, you believe because of that little thing, and God wants some of you to believe in the small things that he is still working in your life. He wants you to believe in the small details that he is still taking care of you, that he is still moving in your life. It doesn't take huge, giant things. It All it does is taking that God is showing you that I I am watching you for you to understand who he is. Come on, somebody say amen. 
So he says, get a load of this. Verily, verily, I say unto you hereafter, after this, ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon a son of man. Jesus was saying to Nathaniel that I am the gate. I am the opening of heaven. I am the way into heaven. And soon you shall see me open heaven and angels descending and and ascending upon me. I shall open heaven and I shall restore that communication between earth and heaven. And when I do that crazy, wonderful things was happening. He was referring to the dream of Jacob. He was referring to the operations that was happening in the dream of Jacob. He said, when you see this heaven opening, I will create an operation in the earth that I can get things to you and I can bring your prayers up and I can move things around in the heavens for you. I can move things in the earth for you because when I get to the cross and when I die for my children and when I take away their sins now that wall of separation will be moved away so now the connection will be reestablished so now I can do what I wanted to do for the children that I love because at first you was blinded from me but now you're free to operate in me first there was wall a wall between you and me now there is freedom with me and you so now I can move in the supernatural and that you can operate in the heavenly realms and the natural realms at the same time because I have died and now I am bringing the Holy Ghost to empower you so now get ready saints I'm about to do something wonderful in your life I'm moving heaven around for you I'm sending angels to your house I'm doing things that you never thought that I could do because now that middle wall of separation is gone so get ready for the power you shall receive power from on high so now saints because i have removed that wall great things are about to happen what you just saw nathaniel is small but i'm about to move in the earth i'm about to do things in the heavens so that no man can say that it wasn't god no man can say that god didn't do this because now i have a relationship with my god and i am so tight with him that all I have to do is pray in the name of Jesus and be in his will and he will move heaven on my behalf. He will move the earth on my behalf. It's time to move in the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus was ultimately talking about salvation but he was also talking about two things. Hallelujah. We will have access to God. Ah, John 4 and 6 said, no man come unto the Father set by me. Hebrews 4 and 14 through 16 says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of God that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus says that now that this wall is separated, you can easily get to me. You can easily cry out to me and I can feel your tears. I can feel your pain. There's new you no longer have to sacrifice animals and birds and spill a whole lot of blood so that you can talk to me those that you can be forgiven now I have died once and for all for my saints so now the blood is forever on the doorpost the blood is forever spilled so now you are forgiven when you ask for forgiveness I shall forgive you and the slate is clean so now you can come to me anytime you want to now you can pray to me anytime you want to now you can reach me like you really want to because I am so close heaven has kissed earth and now we are together so that you have fellowship with God it doesn't take a whole bunch to talk to me you just say Jesus and I am there you say God help me and I am there you say God I need you and I am there because now we're closer than we have ever been now you don't have to have a priest go into the temple and you can't go into the temple now you can come for the altar for yourself kick off your shoes and begin to cry out to me you don't need somebody else to pray for me for you to me you don't need somebody else to say hallelujah for you for I can hear you don't need a priest to do anything you don't need a prophet to pray to me for you but you can get up on your knees everybody is on the same plane now there is no difference everybody is a 
person of God. Everybody is a child of God. Everybody is on the same plane. So if Bishop Brown can pray to God, little Tayana can pray to God because there is no difference now because we are all on the same plane. You dealing with something, God says, come to me. You dealing with something, he says, get help from your pastor and we'll pray together because two or, two or three are gathered together in my name. I shall be in the midst. He said, you have something that you have need of me. Come to me directly because I will answer you because there is no more space in between us. There is no more space between you and me. So I can work quickly. I can work fast. I can work in the anointing. God said, I will do something for you because now we are together. Jesus has opened up the gate and now you can walk into heavenly places anytime you feel like it. When I am in my house, I don't have to go to the church. I don't have to go to a temple. But because that wall is broken down, because we have been forgiven once and for all, I can go into my kitchen if I want to, into my bathroom and talk to God because I have a place in heavenly places with God. I am connected with him so much. That's why when God comes into a place, we just start speaking in tongues out of control because God has chose to sit in the midst of where you are. God has chose to bring heaven down to earth where you are. God has chose to visit you in your seat. He has shown to visit you where you are. So he says it don't take a lot. All you have to do is say hallelujah and we can get something stirred up between you and me from earth to heaven. All you have to do is clap your hands and we can get something stirred up between you and me. All you have to do is praise God and we can get something stirred up between you and me because now we are so close. Now we are so in the same proximity. Now we are so connected that you can cause power from heaven down to earth. Heaven down to earth. So God said we are close. We are in the same proximity. And the second thing he said, we will have access to heaven. He said, I will open up heaven. And you will see angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. He said, this is not just for earthly operation this is not just so the angels can help you on earth but so that you can move things in the heavens as well so you can speak and things happen in the heavens and when they happen in the heavens they happen on earth Jesus said, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so that means that that two places are connected that means that what is happening in heaven God makes it happen on earth and God, Matt, Jesus also told Peter, he said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever shall be loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he mentioned it again to all the disciples within the next two chapters. He is letting you know that not only do you have power on earth, when you speak, God is moving things around in the heavens for you. For him, for you. Jesus is not on earth just sitting on a throne doing nothing, but he is commanding angels on your behalf. He's commanding a host of angels to move to where you are. That's why when we say dispatch the angels in the name of Jesus, God is saying, I will dispatch those angels. I will let them guide you and be around you. Jesus is moving things. He is telling angels to go this place, to go that place. That woman needs help. That man needs help. Angels, do what you got to do. Dispatch in their house. Go to where they are in their car. Go to where they are in their church. Go to where they are because they have sin ended up a request from earth to heaven we have power we have power not just on earth but our words carry up to where God is and he hears them and he does things for us because the connection is together because that connection we're close now with God so Jesus brought salvation to earth and he brought power to earth and he brought anointing to earth. And God was showing Jacob this, the future power of Christ, that there would be a connection between heaven and earth. That we're not just 
humans walking around with no power. But we're connected to the realm where the God who created us is. We're connected to the God who created us. And we have the Holy Ghost, so we have that realm's, that God's power inside of us. So we're able to do supernatural things because we're using the power of God who is in heaven. And we're using the power of God through Jesus Christ who is in heaven. So when you lay hands on somebody, you can have faith that it's not me who's doing it, but power from heaven, power from God through Jesus Christ is flowing through me to touch that person. When you speak a word, you're realizing it's not just a hum- human word. I'm not just using a power from a president. I'm not just speaking in the name of Obama, and I think something's going to happen. But I'm speaking from the name of a person who is in heaven and who has supernatural power. I'm using power from a place from God that is so much bigger than we understand. And that's why God has charged me to preach Jesus because he is the entryway, the gate to power from on high that we cannot even fathom. We want to see more healings we want to see more deliverances take place. We have to understand this all comes from Jesus. John says there was nothing made without Jesus. So everything that was made is controlled by the one who made it. So if we're going to speak to anything, we speak through the power of the one who made it. And that's what Jesus was trying to get everybody to understand. I'm not just from Nazareth. I'm not, I wasn't just born in Bethlehem. I just don't have an earthly mother and a surrogate father. But I am from heaven. And I am reconnecting heaven to earth. And there's a lot of benefits that are coming from this connection. Can we say amen? amen. And that's my sermon for the day we have access to God and access to heaven come on somebody put your hands together somebody lift your hands for Jesus Christ he is worthy to be praised he is worthy to be praised hallelujah just lift your hands we're in the presence of the God who is from heaven we're in the presence of Jesus Christ who came down from heaven. So this is that connecting point. And I just want you to lift him up for a few minutes that we are in that connecting point where human people are connecting with a God. Human people are connecting with a God. And we don't really think about how big that is. We're connecting with something otherworldly. And something otherworldly is living inside of us so that we are spiritual and physical at the same time because we have God inside of us. Just lift up your hands and begin to praise the Lord. We worship you, God. We magnify your name. We thank you, O oh God, for allowing us to utilize this power through your will, O oh God. We will not misrepresent it, oh God, but we will use it to the glory of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, we recognize how great this power 
is, oh God. And I pray, oh God, that each and every person in this place gets more acquainted with that power, gets more, have more knowledge of that power, oh God, that each and every person in here can touch somebody. The preacher doesn't have to touch somebody and they get healed, but a little person can touch somebody and they get healed because the same power which worketh in me worketh in them. And that is the Holy Ghost. That is the power from on high. You said we shall speak in the name of Jesus. We shall lay hands on them who are sick and they shall recover because of the power that is working in us. And that is Jesus Christ. He can do anything. He can move anything in the earth. Because every decision in the earth is first made in heaven. So when it's made, it has to happen. So God has spoken to you and he has made a decision about you. It has to happen here. Because the power who created the earth is the same power who will change it every time he speaks. Every time God speaks, the universe has to shift in order to compensate for what he said. So God told you and you were sick that you will be healed. Your body has no choice but to be healed. Because supernatural words from heaven has come down into your natural life. And your natural life is not strong enough to overturn the supernatural words from God in heaven. So if he spoke to you, you take it and run with it because it has to happen. And each and every person should be thankful that the supernatural God saved you because you couldn't do anything to save yourself. But the supernatural God reconnected the broken pathway so that you can be saved and he said, all you have to do is believe on Jesus. Be baptized in the name of Jesus and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm asking right now, if there's anybody in this place who is not saved. Come down so that you can benefit from this reconnection that Jesus has made. So that you can benefit from this. And if you are already saved, but you need a supernatural touch from God, I ask that you come to this altar and we will pray for you through the power of Jesus Christ. We will pray for you. And if you choose not to come down, lift up your hands where you are and say that God in heaven, speak to me so that my life has to change. And I will agree with what you said because I understand you have power that can change my life. You have power that can change my life. Somebody is needing the Lord right now to deliver them. And God said, I can do it. Just hear from me. I want to speak, but you don't have your ears open to listen. But once you ha have your ears open to listen, I can speak a word. And if you hear it and understand it and do it, your life will be changed for the better. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody, lift your hands and just lift a loud voice unto the Lord. Just lift a loud voice unto the Lord and say, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the ability, oh God, to reconnect us with God. We thank you, Jesus, for your power to change us. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. We will never be the same since you have spoken unto us and we will walk in this 
supernatural power. And we will not underestimate it. We will not underestimate it. You are from heaven. And you have the power to bring heavenly things and heavenly power unto this earth. Somebody clap your hands before Jesus. He's worthy.